off some proper science. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's completely impossible to follow Nikos' lecture. <laughs> Uh, he's so, such a good lecturer. Uh, but uh, what I will do is, I, what you'll notice is that last 40 minutes didn't present any data. <laughs> so we're going to present actually one little bit of data which answers this question. So before we do, first uh, I'll show you that uh, I am dirty, but not quite as dirty as Nikos. So... Can we start with a vote? And this is just a hands up for yes and then a hands up for no. Do you, as the, the MS nurses here, do you discuss the relative effect of a drug on conversion secondary progressive MS? This is DMTs. Do you discuss the effect of that drug on, DMT, uh, on conversion secondary progressive MS when you're counselling patients and helping them pick a drug? So, hands up if you do. <laughs> Good, you and I. <laughs> Splendid. And just to prove that we're not, you guys aren't just thoroughly bored, hands up for no? Okay, great, perfect. We'll come back to you. Huh? <laughs> so, last vote. If you had to pick the single most important efficacy measure for a DMT, what would it be? It's arbitrary, because of course there isn't just one. But in your opinion, what's the most important one? So hands up for the effect on relapses. Okay, so you know, maybe 10 most. Uh, uh, effect on disability worsening. Yeah, let's say, oh yeah, okay, loads. Good, so majority there. Effect on disability reduction. Some DMTs do uh, have been shown to cause a reduction in disability, little events of that. Uh, mm, yep, so, so a very small number. And then effect on secondary progressive MS. Great. So basically, I can't fail. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I hope, I, I, I go for D. Uh, it, uh, there isn't the full evidence for it, but I, I hope that by presenting a bit of data now, I'll persuade you that actually this is quite important. So what I certainly don't need to do uh, is to uh, tell a group of experienced MS nurses what secondary progressive MS is. But let's just be really clear. This is where the vast majority of disability occurs in MS. This is where the vast majority of death occurs in, SP uh, in MS. And with increasing disability, comes at a group level, there are exceptions, but at a group level, increasing disability causes reduced quality of life, including for those family members who are caring for them. Increasing cost, and bear in mind these lower costs are where more of the DMTs have been used, so even despite milder disability absorbing the cost of the DMTs, it's still higher cost when you have moderate or severe disability. Um, there's higher rates of marital breakdown and relationship break, uh, break up as disability goes up. Um, and, uh, and finally, the duration of informal care, that is unpaid care by family members, goes up with disability. So you guys know this, this isn't anything new, but this is why it's important. And so, and why it's so awful that most that the, the, the drug landscape in secondary progressive MS is so poor. So most drugs, we, you know, we can be very clear that in most trials, there's been little, if any, effect uh, of DMTs on secondary progressive MS. Now, you, there's a very good argument about whether we're looking at the right thing and about outcomes, but certainly there's a bigger effect in relapsing disease compared to an SPMS. Now, thankfully, and this is a, a huge relief, finally some light for people with SPMS, that saponimod has been shown uh, to uh, have an effect in SPMS. But again, we have to be cautious. It's not 
having the same effect as it does uh, or as related drugs have in the relapsing phase. And it's in particular subpopulations where it's having its biggest effect. So the question is, why? And we, I'm afraid, do have to discuss a tiny bit of pathology. It's, you guys have worked all week. <laughs> it's Friday evening. <laughs> You're in London. <laughs> We're talking about pathology. I'm sorry, uh, but we have to. <laughs> so in the relapsing phase, we all know that that's driven by inflammation. Inflammation comes along. It causes demyelination. Myelin comes off the nerves. The nerves aren't functioning properly. And then as inflammation resolves and as repair processes happen, the disability level comes back down. And that's hence we get the relapses and remissions. But you guys see in clinic that someone having a relapse one year in makes a much better recovery than someone having a relapse 10, 15, 20 years in. And that's because of a, a number of factors. But the two most important ones are that the body's ability to repair, that remyelination, fails with age. But secondly, it's this line, this dotted line across uh, horizontally. There's a, a, a threshold. And if you look at this particular threshold means, if you look in animals, and if you're an unfortunate rat, either in London or Cambridge, and you have this done to you, and you have 38% of your spinal neurons cut, you haven't got any disability you've got a certain amount of reserve. And after a while, that's probably the same in humans. That reserve gets exhausted. And so as patients with MS increase their disease duration, the failure of repair, the exhaustion of reserve, and a number of other processes lead to a tipping point. And that tipping point goes from the inflammatory phase the more predominantly inflammatory phase, which, where we have medications that can be highly effective, to this other phase, which is predominantly degenerative, meaning that nerves are dying, and they are dying without much input from the inflammation. And therefore, that cascades, and it self-amplifies, and it doesn't matter what drugs we give, or most drugs, it doesn't have much effect on it. So, sorry, that's all the pathology, all right? But it, I just want to make the point that flipping from relapsing disease to secondary progressive disease is a big deal. So if it's such a big deal, why is it not a trial outcome measure? Well, the, the answer is uh, this that it's 10 to 15 years in, on average, in untreated cohorts that patients convert to secondary progressive MS. Can anyone just shout out guesses in months? What is the average duration from when a patient says, I think I'm entering the secondary progressive phase, and when a neurologist says, I agree with you? How long do you think that is? Yeah. Exactly, it's 2.7 years. That's mortifying. Uh, you know, the patient is experiencing it, and we're sitting back and going, nah. <laughs> so it's really important. Now, there are discussions to be had about, well, is it because you have to take away the disease-modifying treatment if you're calling them SPMS? But it makes a point. Conversion to secondary progressive MS is A, hard to define, and in fact, there was no definition of it until two or three years ago, no accepted validated definition. It takes ages to get there, so running a trial of 10, 15 years just isn't gonna happen. But one trial extension did look, and it's the top one. And this was the long-term follow-up of one of the original interferon trials. And it showed no difference between those originally assigned interferon to those originally assigned to placebo. And the reason is not hard to predict. It's because most of the placebo group then got treated after that original two or three year trial period. So I don't think we'll ever be able to use trials to get at conversion to secondary progressive MS. So let's ignore it. You have to use real world data for reasons that Wallace outlined really nicely. You, you, there's much bigger numbers. It's much more realistic to our practice every day. 
And here, there have been seven studies, and six of them have shown that largely injectable therapy, so interferon and uh, glycerin acetate, are associated with reduced conversion secondary progressive MS. And this is really positive. So the last one uh, uh, is, uh, is actually one of the more recent ones. But I'm going to slate all of them because none of them used an objective definition. Uh, none of them uh, uh, mitigated the common sources of bias, or none of them mitigated all of them. And most of them were in quite small numbers of patients. And we're not using as much injectable therapy now as we used to. So, and you might argue I'm biased, but I'd like to present to you. <laughs> this is um, one of the largest studies, and it's used the largest registry in the world, which is MS Base. And so at the point we look through this data, we had access to over 70,000 patients' records. And we were really simple. We just said, let's ask one question. Do drugs reduce conversion to SPMS? But we asked it lots of times. And first, we said, let's compare each drug where we've got enough data to an untreated cohort. And next, we said, why don't we compare injectable therapies to higher efficacy drugs to see if there's a difference between those two. And finally, we said, let's, let's look at early treatment versus late treatment. Now, if you're sensible, you'll say, nah, you can't do that. That's rubbish, and JAMA have lowered their standards. And in some ways, there are issues we can't resolve. But the reason that you might question this is how can you compare someone who gets natalizumab to someone who's untreated. Surely people who are getting the higher efficacy drugs are, have really active disease. Well, we took advantage of the very sad delay in the UK in taking up therapy. And there is a cohort of patients who were untreated, and unfortunately some of them had very active disease. And so we can actually match people. And you heard the term propensity score matching, which I will not bore you with in detail. But what you're doing is you're saying, give me every factor that could alter your decision about whether to give a drug. So the disease duration, how many relapses they've had, how disabled they are, those kind of things. And you create a score. And that score is between naught and one. And then you match someone who's untreated with someone who's treated based on that score. And you have very similar groups. So that's as, as, as sciencey as we're going to get. I'm going to talk you through one slide in detail, and then you're going to see a bunch of other ones which are identical and will be much quicker. So on the left, the tables show you how our matching has worked. And it's really dry. Don't, don't read it in great detail but it shows that roughly each group had similar age, disease duration, relapse rate, and so on. And then along the bottom, you can see we've got quite big numbers of patients. And in this case, we showed that treatment with an injectable therapy is associated with reduced conversion secondary progressive MS compared to no treatment. And then we did exactly the same with fingolimod. That's associated with reduced conversion. So is natalizumab. So is alimtuzumab. And if you're wondering why we haven't got cladribine, ocrelizumab, uh, dimethyl fumarate, and so on, it's because there weren't enough numbers at the time. We'll, we'll try and wangle a future paper out of it in the future when, when we've got more, more numbers. But you cannot do this. You cannot go, Fingolimod looks good. Fingolimod looks better than natalizumab. What you have to do is to directly compare the two groups. You can't 
compare between them because they're different untreated groups. And there's also a slightly boring type of bias that the Fingolimod patients are, uh, are subject to. So to do that, we then compared anyone who was initially treated with an injectable therapy to anyone who was initially treated with Fingolimod, Natalizumab, or Alentuzumab. And you can see that the latter was associated with reduced conversion to SPMS. We're almost there. <laughs> injectable therapies were associated with a much lower rate of conversion if they were given within five years of disease onset compared to giving them after five years of disease onset. But we can't tell from that whether this is preventing or whether it's just delaying. And actually, you would need 40, 50 year data to prove that. But to try and illustrate that perhaps there's a degree of prevention, we examined those receiving injectable therapies within five years to those who are untreated. And I think you can see the lines get further and further apart. And then we repeated it, but this time compared untreated to patients who received uh, uh, injectable therapies five to 10 years. And there's only a very transient difference. And that difference disappears at 14.6 years of disease duration, which is exactly the same time as the end of follow-up here when things are still getting further and further apart. Finally, we said, what about those patients who are on injectable therapies who escalate within five years to those who escalate after five years? And as the story is kind of unfolding, early escalation was associated with a more favorable outcome. So the summary of that paper is that each tested drug was associated with reduced conversion compared to untreated ones. And patients who were on uh, higher efficacy therapies, um, they had a, a lower rate of conversion compared to those on injectable therapies. And treating earlier was associated with, or escalating earlier as well, was associated with reduced conversion. Now, I was asked specifically to talk about first-line therapy, so I hope we've sort of hammered that out. I could have just put the word up, yes, probably. <laughs> so, but there's a few limitations, and don't ever let a real-world researcher talk to you without discussing limitations. I cannot say to you that this is proof. I can say to you that there's an association. So Nikos can say to you, I'm going to prove. I can just say I'm going to find an association. That's because he does trials. Okay. Um, but also, remember, this isn't just about putting everyone in injectable therapy uh, in terms of SPMS conversion. So how about a more pragmatic uh, uh, answer for, uh, for how, what we do when we go back to clinic? Well, I strongly believe that this should be part of our consenting process. And it doesn't need to be complicated. What we've seen from the current data is that the effect on SPMS conversion is, is congruent with and mirrors the effect on relapses. So instead of just saying this causes an X percent reduction in relapses and X percent reduction in, uh, in, in disability outcomes, it's saying it seems to me that the, these higher efficacy therapies have a greater effect on conversion secondary progressive MS than injectable therapies. Um, and I think it is reasonable to confer the same uh, uh, argument in the drugs that we haven't tested, but we should wait and get all the data on that uh, before being definitive about it. Um, of course, we must weigh up side effects, and that's where real-world data is awful. We don't have side effect data uh, to the quality that we should. So uh, may I finish by just asking, and I, I, it's okay, you can't leave until you answer yes. Um, <laughs> does it seem reasonable, at the very least, to consider discussing the effect of, SP, of a drug on SPMS conversion with patients? So hands up for yes. Awesome. Yeah, wonderful. So, uh, and just for the camera, that was everyone. <laughs> <laughs>
um, I, I, will, I will also um, uh, just add um, one slight uh, plug, um, which is to say that all the data that Wallace presented to you, um, uh, the data I've presented, and a whole ton of other stuff, relies on clinicians like you putting data into registries. You don't have time for it. I know that. So me asking you to do it isn't going to make a difference. But please watch this space. We are trying to work on ways of automating it. And I just want you guys to be on board with it, that it's quite useful to have this data so that it can be applicable to your patients. Thank you.